The transformation that we need to go through in order for us to become the people that we want to become depends mainly on the legacy that we want to leave behind. So let me tell you about the legacy that I want to leave behind and the transformation that I went through. As a teenager, I never thought that my life had any particular value. I wanted that to change, but I didn't know how or where to start. But sometimes, you don't have to start that transformation yourself. Now, I want you to imagine every single thing I tell you. I was 15 years old when I had the gun pointed at my head for the first time. <laughs> Very scary. I was 17 years old when I was so close to death that I thought I would never live to see another day. For no crime, I was taken to prison alongside my beloved ones, my cousins Bashir and Rashad. In prison, we were tortured on a daily basis. On top of that, we were starved. Starved to the level where I could see nothing but food. I could imagine nothing but food. Could dream of nothing but food. And tortured to the level where they take us to a floor every day. They beat you. And the day after when you come to the same floor, you see your own blood. On top of that, they will give the torture equipments to my beloved ones. And they would force them to use them on me. I was forced to torture my cousin days and days I had to make him bleed, otherwise we both will be killed. Everything was so extreme, and I never thought I would make it out. I never thought I would ever have a legacy. There was no point of transformation. I was just going to die. But I thought, you know, I have so many beloved ones, so many ones outside. They will care so much about me. They will actually get me out. My mom is so powerful. She will work and find a way to get me out. But one day has passed. One week has passed. One month passed. One year has passed. And nobody get me out. And if you stuck for over a year, there is no way out. Because the only thing I see is people dying. i never seen anyone coming out. And you close one eye, the second eye for a second to try to find peace somewhere. And as soon as you open your eyes, you turn to your right to realize that your younger cousin has died under torture. And the God chose me to carry his dead body to a room we used to call the death room, where they collect all the dead bodies. The smell of that room is the definition of death. The guards would never come inside because it's full of infectious diseases. So they would task the prisoners with all the tasks that they have to do themselves. Suddenly, they gave me a book and a pen. And they said, you have to register him in the files, dead. You know his name, you know he is, register him. At that extremely dark moment, there is no way I can bring Rashad, my cousin, back to life. There's nothing good I could do. An idea came to my head. Now let me take you back in time. When they brought us in, we had to go through interrogation for a month. During interrogation, they forced us to give false confessions. How many officers have you killed? I haven't killed anyone. They beat you until you say you killed one. And just to give you some context of what beat you means, they can pull out your fingernails and it hurts. On top of that, they force you to watch your fingernails being pulled out because they're trying to torture you mentally. During torture, I said that I've killed officers only to stop the torture. I never done such thing. Same thing for my older cousin Bashir. To avoid the torture and the pain, he said that he killed many officers. However, 
The younger one, Rashad, he kept saying, no, I did not kill anyone. They will torture him. He knew he will die under torture because if he keeps saying no, they can't have a conf false confession that will lead him to execution. So at that moment, when I'm going to register Rashad, the younger one dead, I realized Rashad did not say anything wrong during the interrogation. In his file, there is nothing that says that he killed anyone. So if he ever, if he was alive, would go to the court, the judge would release him because he never said he killed anyone. But he's dead. The one who is alive is his brother who said he killed. If he ever goes to the judge, he will be executed because he said he killed someone. At that moment, what you do is, I register the one who's dead in this room with the name of his brother, who is still alive. We switch the names, we switch the files. Now the one who is alive has a different name, his brother's name. If he ever go, goes to court, he will be freed. That little boy doing this, it gave me meaning, purpose, value in my life for the first time. I never had value, I just told you. And suddenly I can do something to save a life. There is nothing more meaningful than saving a life. I loved that day, despite the day, despite the fact that it was the day where my cousin died. So I started to, sounds crazy, but I started to look for the dead people, try to learn the stories, who gave a false confession, who didn't, because by the dead of the people, I could save some people. Having the opportunity to save life has transformed me from being a prisoner to being something else. Being a person with great opportunities to save lives. I loved that role that I got in prison. But I thought I would never make it out, you know. Because the only thing I saw is people dying. I saved some lives. I saved the life of my cousin Bashir for a year. But then himself, he died in my arms. He didn't make it. Because torture was daily. Starvation was daily. And who could get me out, you know? There is no power in this world. A human are torturing me. Animals, they can't come and open the door. Trees wouldn't even move for me. So there's nothing, no power that could save me. A Tuesday, midday, in the middle of the summer, they come to my room, they take me to execution. I, I always wanted to die because things end when you die. However, things happen very quickly. I don't realize what's happening. I wake up in the middle of nowhere. I don't know what happened. I know nothing. Suddenly a car stops there, takes me. A man meets me somewhere and tells me, hey, I'm taking you to meet your mom. I don't know what's true, what is not, what is nightmare, what's not. But I go with that man and we come to a room and he opens the door. And I'm, I was imagining seeing my mother running to hug me and already three years have passed and open the door and no nobody run nobody's running towards me there's no it's empty and with that your heart feels empty too i take a step forward i expect someone to get out of the bathroom someone wait there was no one and i i i sort of gave up at that at that moment, so I decided to take, there was, there was a bed in that room. I haven't seen a bed in years. So there was a bed, so I wanted to go and feel it. I was sitting in a small square on the ground with the dead bodies for years. So seeing a bed clean, it's an hotel room. It's so perfectly clean and made. So I go there and suddenly in the middle, in the middle of that weird feeling, something moves. And I want to see my mom. I, that, was, that was the only hope I could ever have. And then something moves, I turn around. And there was something strange, something weird. And I move, and there was a person moving the same way I was moving. 
It was so ugly, so disturbing, so bloody. There was blood coming from his eyes, from his nose, from his mouth. He had no hair. And he moves exactly the same way I move. So I put my hand forward, trying to erase it. But the mirror does not work that way. And I could not imagine how terrible I looked after these three years of torture. I even didn't think about it. Suddenly, I see a monster standing in front of me in the mirror. No one could look at that monster and like him. No one would like to come close to that one. And I didn't want, after all this suffering that I went through, I didn't want to end up being a monster. Just to learn that because, because I became that monster, skinny, it was much easier for my mother, who is, by the way, the most powerful, the most smart, most intelligent, the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. If I wasn't so skinny at that time, like all the other prisoners looked because of the starvation, we all looked the same. If I wasn't skinny, my mom would have never managed to fix a whole operation to smuggle me out of prison. So that monster was what saved me at that moment. So if I'm gonna say something, the legacy that I, I, I want to leave behind me is a story. A story that despite everything that I went through, everything I went through, from physical to mental torture, from the pain to the, to the starvation to the loss of beloved ones, everything, despite everything, I made it through. And I will die today or tomorrow, I don't know. However, I will die trying to survive. I will die trying to do something good. I will die standing. Sometimes we don't have the privilege to choose in which way we will be transformed and to what. We cannot choose the challenges and the changes that we're going to go through. And that's why today I have no advice for you. And instead, I would say to you, go to hell. Metaphorically, of course, because hell is unavoidable. You're going to go through challenges in your life, pain in your life, suffering in your life that you're going to feel. You can definitely not see any hope. And exactly, exactly that moment of hopelessness and helplessness is the moment when you can transform to the person that you would be proud to present to the world. So in other words, go out to the world and enjoy hell. Thank you.